Hi, everyone. Are you able to hear me and see me? OK, I see a few people saying yes. Perfect. Yes, do you all see and hear? Yes, OK, perfect. So just a brief introduction to today's webinar. I'm Angie, and I work for Adaptica as a product specialist. Today, we present you a webinar from Dr. Robert Arnold. He's a PD ophthalmologist, very, very well known worldwide. So we are very honored to have him today. Just a couple of information, technical information on the webinar. If you have any audio or video problem during the live stream, please just click the reconnect button that you can find in the right, in the right corner below the video. And everything should go back to normal. Also, if you have any questions, they will be answered at the end from Dr. Arnold after the presentation. If you please leave them in the question section below the video and not in the live chat because we may miss them along the way. And I would like to thank everybody for connecting today. We are a lot of people. And I will just let you enjoy the webinar. Well, hello from Alaska. We're excited that all of you are interested in detecting childhood blindness in time to be able to make a difference so people can see the beauties of the world. This is the best of times and the worst of times. It's the best of times because we have some of the best technology available now, commercially available, that can detect factors that lead to amblyopia. It's the worst of times during COVID-19 because we, we are not able to socially get together. And so the technology right now is having trouble getting a hold of the children. So we look forward to the freeing up of restrictions when we can get back to detecting amblyopia early. So I have some things to share with you. Um, I have been working with photo screening for over 20 years, and I have had Adaptica 2 in uh, for many years, uh, both in Alaska and in other parts of the world. I have uh, had an opportunity to do validation studies on many different devices. The one in the front, you may not know, that's the IDEX developed by David Granite, pediatric ophthalmologist in San Diego. And then there is a plus optics, there is a spot, and Adaptica 2 win. About this time last year, I was getting ready to go uh, from America to Europe, where I was in Sicily uh, having an opportunity to speak on uh, topics of amblyopia and vision screening. There I got to meet my very good friend uh, for the first time, amazing inventor, uh, humanitarian, uh, brilliant uh, doctor who uh, came up with the idea for an infrared photo screener. Um, and I'm holding the infrared wand. I have the advantage of several students who have worked with me to uh, do vision screening in different areas. We do outreach clinics in parts of Alaska where photo screening, including plus optics, has been used extensively to detect early amblyopia so we can treat children in very remote parts of Alaska. I have extensive experience not only with the two in, but with other photo screeners, including Go Check Kids, but the original photo screener, the MTI photo screener, which no longer has Polaroid film, we did an extensive outreach in Alaska for validation. And then I have a uh, patent pending on a different vision screening device, which is works on the Nintendo 3DS screen. And our uh, app is called PDI Check. I have taken vision screening with me uh, to a war zone in Western, in Eastern Burma called the Karen State, where we do vision screening and cataract surgery with the medics there. We examine many, many children as well as adults and try and provide uh, medical care. But this is a part of the world that does not have any 
uh, glasses or spectacle dispensing. So we have to bring the spectacles with us, including making custom glasses for children and adults um, out of something we can, uh, an optical shop we can carry in a backpack. Back in 2013, I bought my first Adaptica 2 in and had a chance to use it with the medics there on adults and children in Burma. We, we did comparative studies on many children using the two in, but also the spot and the plus optics uh, photo screeners. Last year, we became familiar with the new uh, added case that can protect and enhance the performance of the two in called the Kaleidos. It's particularly helpful if you have bright sunlight coming into the room so the photo screener can see the patient looking in a dark uh, area uh, at exactly the right distance for focus. We had some problems in our clinic because there was no internet. Um, and so the Wi-Fi connection did not, uh, did not work very well, but we were able to function with Kaleidos with the help of the medics who opened the back of the Kaleidos and activated the two in manually. One of the people who has done a lot of work with two in is my daughter-in-law, uh, Stephanie Kirk Arnold. And uh, here is her presentation at the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus with my son uh, last year when we still could meet. This is at the American Academy of Ophthalmology uh, at the Adaptica booth. So here are uh, four photo screeners that we have validated. The two in here is on the top, which is the smallest and the most portable, next to the plus optics, the spot, and this is the eye screen photo screener, which resembles the old MTI photo screener. Here in Burma are all three, the plus optics, the spot, and the two in being used to check refraction. This is for us a very hot and humid environment and the spot broke because uh, it was uh, not able to handle the humidity very well. The plus optics did quite well and it has the opportunity to change the batteries, um, but it requires very, very high energy batteries. The two win was the most convenient because it uses just a regular uh, USB charger um, and it worked very very well so this is my daughter-in-law again uh, and her first paper that came out in 2014 comparing the two win to the spot and the plus optics this is a receiver operating characteristic curve for the two win which shows that it performs very well we would pick this right here as the referral criteria of choice. The spot and the two-in were identical at that time, plus optics was a little bit better because two-in was working on their software at that time. Since then, uh, with the help of Dr. Mario Angi and, and others, two-in has come with a CR function or a corneal reflex function that helps in the detection of intermittent and constant strabismus. You'll notice my daughter-in-law has a black occluder over her right eye, but through the infrared part of the, of the two in, you're able to see her pupil reflex. While this is dark for her, her eye seeks an alignment at rest. So an intermittent strabismus will manifest with the CR over her eye. This is her study, which shows a ROC curve with very good performance finding amblyopia risk factors, but these are refractive risk factors, but the ROC curve improved significantly with the addition of the CR function for detection of strabismus. In that same study, we compared the refractive estimate of the two win to the Retinomax, which is a fairly famous uh, autorefractor, handheld autorefractor, 
that costs almost twice as much as the two win. And the performance of, of the refraction for um, myopia and hyperopia was very good for both devices. This shows the correlation between uh, retinoscopy and the two wind uh, assessing cylinder power. <clears throat> this is a measurement using the CR function, the black infrared wand, to find two winds estimate over here of on the on the y-axis uh, of the alignment, the horizontal alignment compared to the uh, cover test. And the last here is J0 vector transformation and J45 vector transformation of uh, astigmatism showing that the two win does a beautiful job of detecting complex refractive error um, from a distance of about one meter away from the patient. So again, whether it's in Burma or Alaska, we have had good use with the two win here in the open back part of a Kaleidos case. In Alaska, we were able to use the case just as well as you will in your clinics with Wi-Fi or now with Bluetooth. So you don't have to open the back of the case um, and you can activate the two in using Kaleidos with a nice tablet. And so the two in was able to perform very well and we find it particularly useful for uh, estimating refractive error uh, even before you do um, cycloplegic or uh, non-cycloplegic retinoscopy. So um, I think that's my presentation. Um, I, I would be very, very happy to hear um, from all of you, your experiences with photo screening in the various different parts of the world that you are and um, your hopes and aspirations for how photo screening and refractive estimation using the Adaptica 2Win can help you in um, assessing vision impairment, uh, and uh, also in detecting amblyopia risk factors in young children so they can get their glasses and treatment and improve their brain vision so they can have a permanent uh, high quality brain vision for the rest of their lives. So, uh, let's see if I can check my way out. Good. In, in Alaska right now, most physician offices are limited to taking care of urgent and emergent problems. And we usually make use of the photo screening as a part of a normal, healthy, well child check. We recommend photo screening between the ages of one and two years, again, between the ages of three and four years, and then at the time of kindergarten entry or about the age between five and six. We have found that photo screening is more reliable on young children who are not yet used to cooperating with uh, public experiences. After kindergarten, children are used to lining up and doing instructions. So they are more likely to be able at that point to do a visual acuity screening test with the non-tested eye patched. So we recommend photo screening uh, three different times during a child's uh, early or preschool years. And then, we do patched acuity testing to determine other aspects of the vision in children during their first decade of life. That is our current plan to do the best we can to screen for amblyopia and get treatment started 
early enough for it to make a difference. We find that all of the photo screeners that are commercially available now are far better than doing no screening as far as detecting amblyopia. I think one of the advantages of the Adaptica 2N in my experience is that it, it does a good quick job of estimating refractive error, even in children who don't sit still very well. So in your areas, there may or may not be public funds available for photo screening. In Alaska, photo screening started out with no medical reimbursement. So most of the photo screening was being done by volunteers and charitable organizations, particularly the Lions Club. In the meantime, uh, there were opportunities for photo screening to become available to pediatricians. And some of the pediatricians invested in photo screeners and some not. <clears throat> in general, our photo screeners that have the ability to detect refractive error are not likely to be used in adults. But in some screening environments, adults wanted to see if what would happen if their photo screener, like a plus optics photo screener, was used on them. Adaptica, in a smart way, has used the two win both for adults and children. And we have found in charitable outreaches, sort of like this one in Burma, there are a lot of times where there are charitable outreaches where there is not an expert eye doctor to determine the relationship between whatever the instrument says and, and the patient. So the two win uh, has the most precise refractive error estimate in children and adults of that we have found in the photo screeners that give estimates of refractive error. The photo screener in the two win uses an infrared light, so it's actually flashing multiple times, but the children don't get upset by the flash because it's invisible and infrared. In summary, I think that each one of you will find the ease of use and the accuracy of refraction very helpful in the two-end instrument. And I am very, very proud of Mario Angi for inventing such a good device. Thank you, Doctor. If you scroll now, Below the video, you can see already a few questions that uh, the participants left. So it looks like some of the experience that they have is, is working with different photo screeners and comparing the photo screeners, which we've had the opportunity to do. I think photo screeners are a little bit like rental cars. If I travel to Europe and I go to a place and I try and rent a car and they want me to use a Volkswagen, but I wanted to use a Citroen, I usually won't be upset with a rental car. I'll use whichever one will take me from point A to point B. So all the photo screeners now are far better than no screening at all. They will take you from not knowing who has amblyopia and they will do a good job of finding children who need care for amblyopia. But as soon as you want to buy your own car, then you worry what much more about different features. I would say the advantages of the two win are price, portability, sturdiness, ease of charging with the USB charger uh, and simple replaceable battery and the accuracy of refraction. It's also one of the easier and quicker devices to get a result on a child. The Plus Optics has very extensive uh, use and it has a more interactive touch screen on the back. The 
uh, Plus Optics is also the only one that will use regular commercial AA batteries. But if you use low quality AA batteries, it's, it doesn't provide enough power to use the Plus Optics. The Spot was originally borrowed from Plus Optics by its American distributor called Pediovision. And it was sold to Welsh Allen, which is a large company. It's actually the probably maybe the largest photo screening company. But they have yet to do any improvements on the spot since they bought it from uh, Plus Optics. Um, there are also two or three, um, they seem like uh, uh, spot modification uh, systems that are available uh, manufactured in China. <clears throat> I see a very good question here about photo screening and also visual acuity. And when I compare photo screening to visual acuity, I do not think of one as better than the other, but it's mainly related to how much time you have and how young the children are. So photo screening allows you to do something very fast. If you have a room with 30 children in it, you can photo screen them in 15 minutes, where if you do careful acuity screening, acuity screening for us takes four to five minutes per child to get a threshold visual acuity. But the photo screener is not actually looking at the optic nerve function or the actual visual acuity. And so you really, in a, in a screening for amblyopia, you need early detection of risk factors that can be treated, particularly refractive risk factors, and later careful detection of visual acuity. If you have excellent nurses and orthoptists, you can get visual acuity in children as young as three or maybe even two years of age. But when you do mass screening, it's not efficient to quickly look for visual acuity until children are over four years of age. I see, I see a good question about disclosing my fan, financial interests. I am an unpaid advisor to Adaptica, but also an unpaid advisor to Plus Optics, Go Check Kids, and iScreen. I coordinate the Alaska Blind Child Discovery, which is a charitable outreach. And the Alaska Blind Child Discovery has received discounted vision screening equipment from many vendors. And it also um, has had to purchase other vision screeners that didn't want to donate them to ABCD, uh, including the brand new um, Rebion Blink. Um, but afterwards, they did give us a, a small discount. I have a small company called PDI Check that develops vision screening, 3D color and uh, monocular acuity screening on the Nintendo 3DS screen. And I also have a company that makes uh, retinopathy of prematurity um, uh, online uh, screening uh, system for NIC use. So there are some questions about uh, strabismus or squint detection. And the 2-Win with its CR function uh, is, the, is the only photo screener that specifically is trying to determine the difference between uh, the amount of strabismus and the character of strabismus, meaning intermittent, uh, phorias, or constant strabismus. The other photo screeners, SPOT and Plus Optics particularly, use corneal light reflex to guess something about strabismus also. Um, when it comes to the question of strabismus, um, I was a participant in the PDIG amblyopia treatment trials, and we found over time that general community detection of amblyopia separated the treatable forms of amblyopia into three types. One, purely refractive, such as anisometropia or high uh, astigmatism, two, constant strabismus alone, and third, a mixture of refractive error and strabismus. So typical 
uh, amblyopia that was treated by the PEDIG study had about one third refractive error, one third strabismus, and one third a mix between the two. So if when that is the case, the strabismus is something that needs to be detected with something other than a refractive detector. So most photo screeners are looking at a crescent of light in the pupil and detecting refractive error, but they also can be tuned to look for strabismus. It turns out in the PEDIG studies that the strabismic amblyopia patients, almost all had amblyopia with strabismus greater than 20 prism doctors or 10 degrees. So most of the patients with strabismic amblyopia alone were, were obvious to see. You could see their squint from a distance and you did not need a photo screener to detect them. The patients with very small angle strabismus only amblyopia are very rare. If you look for small angles of strabismus with young children, you can end up getting a, a much higher over referral for strabismus because many children do not look very well at the photo screener when it screens and they may not actually just be looking at the screener when, um, when they are screened. When, when we get done and we get a referral from a photo screener, we believe that the photo screener has detected hyperopia, which is fairly high, but it is not sufficiently accommodated by that child. In America, we usually call a level of hyperopia after cycloplegic refraction of 3.5 diopters or more uh, a high amount of hyperopia. But some children with high hyperopia, even plus four or more, can compensate with accommodation for their hyperopia, and they do not need spectacles, where other children, particularly the, some with Down syndrome and developmental delays, may have hyperopia less than 3.5 diopters, but they still need glasses, as if they were an older person needing bifocals for presbyopia. So the photo screener, instead of finding absolute cycloplegic hyperopia, does a better job of finding the children who cannot compensate for the hyperopia that they have. See if there are any more questions. These are very, very good questions. So, we have two published cases where we have used the two in photo screener and there are three papers right now that are in the works that are coming out that will uh, show more validation of the two in photo screener compared to the retina max and compared to the go check kids um, photo screener which is an application that goes in an iphone 7 plus We have had excellent uh, experience using the two in photo screener in children down to an age of um, less than one year. Um, one of the nice things about the two in is that it has uh, bright, sparkling, colorful lights and noises that uh, most children are excited to stare at, even when they're very young. You've got great questions. Doctor, I can see one below. Somebody's asking, there are accommodation differences from red light for fixation or the colored lights because they saw some difference. Did you experience this? Our most recent uh, experience has been comparing the two-in to a modification of the GoCheck kids 
trying to determine what device will uncover the most hyperopia, meaning cycloplegic hyperopia, in children. When that happens, we want the child to look at the photo screener, but relax their accommodation while they're looking at the photo screener, a somewhat unnatural task for a child, but a common task for an old grandparent who forgets their reading glasses. If you turn on the twinkling lights of the two win, the twinkling light stimulates accommodation and the photo screener then only detects the children with the bad amount of hyperopia that they can't accommodate for. The, the modification of the Go Check Kids, instead of using a detailed light, uses a blurry light and the blurry light was able to uncover more hyperopia. It may be in your screening environment, you want to find all the cases with hyperopia. But if you have a limited amount of resources, photo screening to detect the children who are not able to compensate for their amblyopia and their hyperopia may be more your interest. And for us, getting the child interested in the device, screening them quickly, and finding the ones who absolutely need hyperopic correction is more important in our remote screening than to try to detect all the cases of hyperopia. There were two large studies in America, uh, one done in Los Angeles and the other in Baltimore, where community children were examined with cycloplegic refraction. 8% of those children had hyperopia more than 3.5 diopters, but only about 2.5% of those children had amblyopia. And that means that approximately three out of four cycloplegic hyperopic children can compensate for their hyperopia adequately to develop good vision. And only one in four high hyperopic children need spectacles urgently. Another question that I can see from Dr. Carlos Chua is during your outreach projects, how easy it was for the volunteers to use the devices? That's a very good question because the simplicity of learning how to use the device is pretty important. If you have a cooperative child, like you can see in this slide, they sit still and they look at the camera and they're willing to wait for you. But there are autistic children and other children with delays or very young children that the screener has to be quite quick at looking at the focus. The way the two win focuses is it gives you uh, an image we of the child's question pupils here. and their face on the screen, and you move back and forth until you get a modified green bar above the picture to show um, whether they're in, whether they're in focus or not. Um, the two win has been easy for. Uh, people to use, how, learn how to focus, even when they're not eye doctors. There's a, there's a good question here about the Go Check uh, Kids application that might be of interest to many of you. The Go Check Kids takes advantage of the fact that almost all smartphones have to put their flash right next to their lens. And if they did not want to get a red reflex, they would try to put the flash as far away from the lens as possible. But that means that your fingers will be covering up the lens or the flash part of the time when you're taking pictures. So almost all smartphones can work as photo screeners. Um, Go Check Kids right now has used the, uh, the iPhone 7 Plus. But in the future, new phones will be able to be adapted to photo screening. So 
Go Check Kids is not limited only to the iPhone 7 Plus, but it takes a while to validate new lenses and new phones. These are great questions. So um, one of the things that's been a slight difference for us in America is during the COVID-19 crisis, we have not wanted to have children and parents crowded in the waiting room, coughing on each other. And so, bringing the child into the office, putting in the cycloplegic after uh, initial examination, sending them back to the waiting room for 30 to 60 minutes, and then bringing them back for another examination has been called into question. Not that it isn't the best way to find hyperopia, but whether or not there's a way to determine uh, the amount of hyperopia that would not require cycloplegia. Um, we have, we have developed a horizontally held sciloscopy rack that looks like an American yellow school bus. And we, we can uncover 94% of cycloplegic hyperopia using the school bus uh, accommodation relaxing sciloscopy. Um, but an important part of an exam following a uh, photo screening is to determine how much hyperopia the child may have and how much they are accommodating and whether or not those two uh, in combination are placing that child at risk for vision loss. That asked from Chiara, what do you think about the comparison with retinoscopy in the practical clinic? So when, when you yourself know how to do retinoscopy on children, it makes you a relatively rare eye doctor. Adult eye doctors with autorefractors in their office are nowadays not doing as much retinoscopy as they used to, especially in America. So the main expert retinoscopists still are pediatric eye doctors. Um, the vision in preschooler study, the VIP study, uh, which was a large American study, uh, had pediatric optometrists doing dry refraction as one of their 11 vision screening tools. And the pediatric optometrist doing dry retinoscopy was actually one of the most sensitive forms of vision screening um, of all 11 tests. So an expert with retinoscopy can uncover a lot of amblyopia and then they may be able to do it quite quickly. In my practice, uh, I've done years and years of retinoscopy, but there are times when the two win is able to give me a good guess as to which direction to go in my retinoscopy on a child that does not want to cooperate. So, um, I believe that a tool that can get a refraction in a child that doesn't want to cooperate and doesn't want to sit up close to something um, is a very, very helpful tool. So the Kaleidos case, um, it helps on children who are a little bit older, but a dark room with a with a with just a handheld two-win is better for the younger children in our experience. Add one thing, since we are available worldwide, what would you say, doctor, about the measurement with different phenotypes and different ethnicities? Did you find any problems with that during your outreach projects? 
That's a good question. So we've seen uh, Africans with very dark oh, eyes, asking, with very dark we able eyes to and Alaska natives with very dark eyes, that if they have um, enough uh, dim in the room and their eyelids are wide open, we're able to get excellent photo screens with the Adaptica 2N. Um, but the 2N is also not wanting to miss a, ch a child with a cataract. If we have children whose eyelids are not open or who have eyelashes that hang over the pupil, the, the device is worried that it might be missing a cataract. And so it may, it may be reluctant to give a guess as to the refractive error in a child whose eyelids are partly covering the pupils. That is true of the spot, and it's also true of the plus optics. And on Adaptica to recommend glasses for children during your stay in Burma. That is a current project that I'm working on with my son-in-law, and that is to compare the quality of the reading directly out of the two win to whether or not you could prescribe glasses. From Amal? So we do not have the project completed yet, but we're very, very hopeful that the high quality refractive estimate in a children mm -hmm. and adults uh, with two win will make it practical for clinics that have access to glasses, but they don't have access to an eye doctor to do and evaluate the refraction. Um, so in our comparisons between the three main infrared uh, refractive devices, the plus optics, the spot, and the two win, the two win has dedicated itself to estimating the quality of the refraction, the sphere, the cylinder, and the axis. The, the spot and the plus optics have been more uh, em emphasizing the quality of the referral for refractive risk factors. And so I believe that, this, that this, uh, the two win is, is finding itself better at estimating refractive error cylinder and axis particularly. How reliable is this machine in case of cornea scarring? So if you have corneal scarring or cataract, uh, the device is reluctant to make a refractive estimate. Um, so significant cataract or corneal scarring or eyelid or eyelashes covering the pupil will limit its ability to make an estimate of refraction. The 2N allows you to check refraction in the right eye or the left eye separately. It does not only require you to do refraction in both eyes. Um, so if you have a child who needs glasses in their right eye but has scar on the left eye, the 2N works very, very well to estimate the refraction in the in the remaining eye. On the other hand, I have found the 2N to be very useful in a challenge that is a child who could be soon to have corneal scarring, and that is a new herpes simplex lesion on the cornea causing intense photophobia, red eye, and the beginning of a scar. Children like that are very hard to examine because they're so photophobic. They need the examining room learn light turned all the way off. When you need to look at them, they don't like you coming at them with a the light. Um, but I've been able to use the two win to look at their pupil reflex in the dark because it's using infrared light to aim at their pupils and it doesn't upset them. So in a second function, of the two win is to be able to look at red reflex uh, without having bright light in a child's eyes.
So, um, the, the two win allows you to select bright flashing fixation lights or sound, or it can turn it quiet with not as bright fixation lights. That's one option. The other option is, is screening both eyes or the right eye or the left eye. Both of those are very useful uh, in screening challenging children, but it takes a while for a new lay screener to learn all those functions. Um, and so if you have an inexperienced screener and a very difficult child with a scar and only one eye, it, even though the device has the ability to check them, it would be, uh, you wouldn't want to expect someone to, uh, to learn how to do that in their first uh, dozen screenings. But it's very, very easy to screen the right eye or the left eye alone with, with the two in. I hope that answers the question. There's a good question here about measuring uh, the axial length. Um, and so the, the two win gets its reading from approximately one meter away from the child. It does not measure corneal curvature and it does not measure axial length of the eye. The Retinomax, which is a Hartman Shack driven handheld auto refractor has uh, an optional function, which is uh, keratometry. So it's held very close to the eye, um, one eye at a time, and it will measure uh, corneal curvature, but it also does not measure axial length. I do not know a of a device that can measure axial length very well without having it be like an IOL master for adults. Uh, and some children, or contact uh, A-scan ultrasound uh, to measure the axial length. Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, I'm not seeing anyone comment right now. So I hope we, the doctor replied to all of your concerns. And I would like to thank him very much for sharing his experience with us today in this webinar. If you need more information on the devices or any commercial information, you can find it on our website at aptica.com and also on all of our social media. So follow us there to keep up. Of course, we have other webinars coming up. For those as well, you can find information on our social media. And for any more questions, you can just contact your local di di distributor. You can find the list on our website, adaptica.com, to get in touch with them and know if there are any current discounts or, or promotion. So I hope you have a good evening or morning wherever you are in the world. And thank you, doctor, very much for attending us, attending with us today. And goodbye to everybody. Thank you for attending. We wish everyone good health, hand washing, social distancing, and soon we look to be able to get together and uh, give each other a hug after COVID-19 is over. Exactly. Lots of love coming from Italy. And Alaska.